Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I hope everyone is having a very happy Thanksgiving season. I want to talk here uh, just a little bit about something that I find of interest to me. I don't know if uh, you'll find it of interest to you, but I think that it is timely given the Thanksgiving holiday. Now, in order to talk about this, I want to sort of get back, step far back and get a broader view than just an individual view. You know, I've been asked uh, the question a lot, you know, Steve, why is the church the way it is today, given the fact that we believe what we believe? And I've received all kinds of answers such as, well, people don't study and, and you know, this is what my parents believed and so on and so forth. I'd like to give you a little bit of a historical perspective. Now, for those of you who don't like a history lesson, uh, you might want to click off of this right now. But for those of you who will bear with me, I think you'll find this very interesting. I want to talk about how that the church became, became what it is today. If you follow this channel, you know that basically we believe in the five basic uh, principles or tenets of Calvinism, the Calvinistic doctrine, which I believe defines the gospel, the very gospel, the nature of the gospel itself. Now, what you're going to find interesting in this video, and I'll go ahead and just kind of spill the beans for you right here, right now, and that is uh, pilgrims, the ones who landed there at Plymouth Rock, the pilgrims that came over on the Mayflower uh, were, guess what? They were Calvinists. Now, to understand this, you, you got to get the, the historical perspective. Now, historians have accounted for this uh, enthusiastic embrace of, of uh, sort of the revivalist mentality that, that came and swept across the landscape of the country after the landing of the pilgrims at Plymouth Rock, this religiosity. They've, they've accounted for this in part by stressing the heritage of the American Revolution. Building on the ideals of the revolution, the Bill of Rights codified the protection of religious freedom. That's something that we all cherish, and that's something that we all try to work hard to preserve, and, and that's something that we really do admire and respect. But I think you're going to find something interesting about this, because uh, in that Bill of Rights, the, the religious freedom, the, the freedom of, to exercise uh, the religion the religion of your choice. It came to be what it is today. You know, forbidding the federal government to establish an official state church, like, well, it's kind of like what the pilgrims fled from in England, or to impede on the free exercise of religion. The so-called Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment meant that citizens no longer needed to pay taxes to the Church of England and they could basically worship in any way that they decided to, in any tradition of their choosing. We as Christians have to adore that right. But when looked at from a purely theological perspective, what was intended to help shape and preserve a great nation, well, actually it led to a breakdown in the bedrock of sound doctrinal truth required to redeem and save uh, an individual, because this federal protection of religious freedom paved the way for a proliferation of Protestant religious sects, each one of them vying to meet the nation's spiritual needs. Many of these revivalists, they abandoned the comparatively formal style of worship observed in the well-established Congregationalist and, and Episcopalian churches, and they instead embraced more diverse forms of worship that were found in new and alternative uh, denominations. Charles Finney, uh, a horseback preacher of the 19th century, he played a significant role in shaping the American landscape. Methodism achieved the most remarkable success, the most significant denominational increase in American history, and was by far the most popular American denomination by 1850. Methodists, they used 
itinerant preachers known as circuit riders uh, who won converts by pushing west, uh, bringing religion to new settlers hungry to have their spiritual needs met. Circuit riding took preachers into homes, meeting houses, churches. The truth is that the original Puritan colonists who embraced Calvinism, who stepped off the Mayflower in 1620, could not have dreamed of just how much its own longing for freedom would spark a revolution that would eventually result in a rejection of the core principles that defines the gospel by which we are saved. These Puritans, they shared with other Calvinists a belief in double predestination that some people, the elect, were destined by God to receive grace and salvation while others were destined for hell. No one, however, could merit salvation. According to covenant theology, Christ's sacrifice on the cross made possible the covenant of grace by which those whom God chose could be saved. Puritans believed in unconditional election and irresistible grace. God's grace was given freely without condition to the elect and could not be refused. That's one of the tenets of Calvinism. Now folks, these were the ones who stepped off the Mayflower. That's right. That's how our country began. These revolutionary ideals, they created a substantial theological crit critique of Calvinism that had far-reaching consequences for religious individuals and for society as a whole. Calvinism suddenly seemed too pessimistic for Americans. Worshippers increasingly began to take responsibility for their own spiritual fates by embracing theologies that emphasized human merit in affecting salvation. Are you hearing me? And revivalist preachers were quick to recognize the importance of these cultural shifts. Some spiritual leaders, such as Lyman Beecher of the Congregational Church, appealed to younger generations of Americans by adopting a less orthodox approach to Calvinist doctrine. More radical revivalist preachers, such as Charles Finney, well, you know, they put theological issues aside and evangelized by appealing to worshipers' hearts and emotions. And though these men didn't see eye to eye, they both contributed to the emerging consensus that all souls are equal in salvation and that all people can be saved by surrendering to God. This idea of spiritual egalitarianism was one of the most important transformations to emerge out of the Second Great Awakening. Egalitarianism, the doctrine that all people are equal and deserve equal rights and opportunities. Sound familiar? Spiritual egalitarianism dovetailed neatly with an, an increasingly democratic United States. In the process of winning independence from Britain, the revolution weakened the power of long-standing social uh, hierarchies and the codes of conduct that went along with them. From the institutional side, its democratizing uh, opened the door for a more egalitarian approach to spiritual leadership. Whereas preachers of long-standing denominations like the Congregationalists were required to have a divinity degree and at least some theological training in order to become spiritual leaders, many alternative denominations only required a conversion experience, a, a supernatural call to preach. This meant, for example, that a 20-year-old guy that was, that was out you know, uh, walking behind a plow or, or a 20-year-old that, that was working in a, a mill, he could go from being you know, that to, to a full-time circuit riding preacher for the Methodists practically overnight. And sounds fun. I mean, I'd have done that. Probably. Maybe. It was their emphasis on spiritual egalitarianism over formal training that enabled Methodists to, to outpace spiritual competition during this period. Methodists attracted more new preachers to send into the field, and the lack of formal training meant that individual preachers could be paid, you know, well, a whole lot less 
than a Congregationalist preacher with a divinity degree. And, it, you know, if I'd have had a pretty Palomino, well, I mean, I would have probably done it for nothing. But I, I'd have probably had more, I'd have probably had something more like this. The Second Great Awakening, 1790 to 1850, give or take. Armed evangelical Christians with a moral purpose to address and eradicate the many social problems arising from these dramatic demographic shifts. For individual worshipers, spiritual egalitarianism in revivals and camp meetings could break down traditional social conventions. For example, revivals generally admitted both men and women, and furthermore, in a, in a, in a, during a period when many American Protestants discouraged or, or outright forbade women from speaking in church meetings, some preachers provided women with new opportunities to openly express themselves and participate in spiritual communities. Some preachers also promoted racial integration in religious gatherings, expressing equal concern for white and black people's spiritual salvation and encouraging both slaveholders and, and the enslaved to attend the same meetings. Historians have even suggested that the extreme physical and, and vocal manifestations of conversion seen at these impassioned revivals and, and camp meetings offered the ranks of worshipers uh, a way to, to enact a sort of social leveling by flouting the codes of self-restraint prescribed by upper-class elites. Although the revivals didn't always live up to such progressive ideals in practice, particularly in the more conservative regions of the slaveholding South, the concept of spiritual egalitarianism nonetheless challenged and changed the ways that Protestant Americans thought about themselves, their God, and one another. Post millennialists uh, believed, you know, that Christ would return to Earth after the millennium. It was during this pe period that that really that post millennialism dominated the spiritual, the religious scene. In the newly settled frontier regions, the revival was implemented through camp meetings. These often provided the first encounter for some settlers with organized religion. The camp meeting was a religious service of several days length with preachers and settlers in, in the thinly populated areas they gathered at the camp meeting uh, for fellowship as well as worship. And the, the sheer exhilaration of participating in a religious revival with crowds of hundreds and perhaps thousands of people inspired the dancing, the shouting, the singing that were associated with these events. The revivals also followed an, an arc of great emotional power with an emphasis on the individual's sins and his need to turn to Christ and a sense of restoring personal salvation. Now, this differed from the Calvinist's belief in predestination, which emphasized the inability of men to save themselves and decreed that the only way to be saved was by God's electing grace. Upon their return home, most converts joined or created small local churches, which grew, grew rapidly, in fact. The camp meeting revival spread religious enthusiasm and became a major mode of church expansion, especially for the Methodists and the Baptists. Presbyterians and Methodists, they initially they worked together to host the early camp meetings, but the Presbyterians eventually became less involved because of all the noise and the often, you know, the loud screeching activities that occurred. Historians stress this reform as being a part of God's plan, of which I have to agree, and I'll comment on that as close to the end of the video. Most today agree that we should not have done this. Local churches saw their roles in society in purifying the world through the individuals to whom they could bring salvation and through 
changes in the law and the creation of institutions, transforming the world was applied to mainstream political action to implement their beliefs into national politics. And I have reminded you people time and time again how that Jesus did not advocate for the overthrow of Nero or cultural change or any of that other kind of stuff. These associations and, and their evangelical members, they also lent moral backing and manpower to large-scale social reform projects, including the temperance movement designed to, to curb Americans' consumption of alcohol, the, the abolitionist campaign to eradicate slavery in the United States, and women's rights uh, to improve women's political and economic rights. As such wide-ranging reform projects combined with missionary zeal, evangelical uh, Christians formed a uh, benevolent empire that swiftly became a cornerstone of that period. Moralists grew concerned about the growing mass of urban residents who didn't attend church and who, you know, thanks to poverty or illiteracy, didn't even have access to Scripture. Voluntary benevolent societies exploded in number to, to tackle these issues. Led by ministers and dominated by middle class women, voluntary societies printed and distributed Protestant tracts. They taught Sunday school, they distributed outdoor relief, and they evangelized in both frontier towns and, and in the urban slums. These associations and their evangelical members they also lent moral backing and manpower to large-scale uh, projects that, 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 that just swept across America like, like a prairie fire. The, the, the period that I'm talking about was a very unique period in U.S. history. It, it, it defined us as, it, it, it came to define who we are today as far as the theological landscape is concerned. But it didn't start that way. It didn't start that way at Plymouth Rock. This Charles Grandison Finney that I've been talking about, he introduced Arminianism into mainstream Christianity in the 19th century. Uh, it began with Jacob Arminius, but, but Finney really pushed it, pushed it hard across the American landscape. Churches today would honor the man. But Finney, folks, was a heretic. And that language is not too strong. His views were almost pure Pelagianism, also called Pelagian heresy, which is the Christian uh, po theological position that original sin didn't taint human nature and that human will is still capable of choosing good or evil without special divine aid or assistance. The arguments that he employed to sustain those views were nearly always rationalistic and philosophical, not biblical. And if you've been following us in Colossians, you know that's not the direction that we're to go. To canonize this guy as an evangelical hero is to ignore the facts of what he stood for. By no stretch of the imagination does Finney deserve to be regarded as a true evangelical. By corrupting the doctrine of justification by faith, by denying the doctrines of original sin and total depravity, by minimizing the sovereignty of God, while enthroning the power of the human will, and above all, by undermining the doctrine of substitutionary atonement, Finney filled the bloodstream of American evangelicalism with poisons that have dominated the religious establishment a religious system based on human merit to this day. A movement which we now know today as we refer to, I refer to, as modern evangelism. If you call yourself a Christian and you are part of the world religious system based on human merit, you owe much of your belief system not to, to the pilgrims who stepped off the Mayflower, but to how America changed after they landed after they landed at Plymouth Rock. National political freedom spawned religious freedom at the expense of true Christian liberty afforded by sound doctrine. The gospel, which is the power of God to salvation, was discarded in favor of a man-centered other gospel 
And this is the world, folks, that you and I were born into. Okay? It's not just that people don't study. That's, that's, that's true. And that's, that's on an individual level. If you want to talk about it on an individual level, that's why things are the way they are. But if you want the broader perspective, you got to look at this. This is the world that you and I were born into. An apostate world religious system that long ago abandoned the basic principles that define the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ that the pilgrims brought over here with them. Happy Thanksgiving. Now, as a clo on, a, you know, on a closing note here, I have my own theory as to why I believe God willed a religious system based on human merit to dominate the American landscape. In, in fact, not just dominate the American landscape, but spread across the entire world. My adherence to the true gospel of grace demands that I believe that God is sovereign and has allowed this. That's number one. This religious system cannot redeem man's spirit, yet it is no doubt sustaining the flesh by its very emphasis on law-keeping, human wisdom, philosophy, the commandments of men, even the, the signs that you see of the Ten Commandments of God along the highway. Rather than the Gospel of Christ, I believe it is helping prevent the total collapse of human society until Christ does return, where that God's people continue to be redeemed by grace regardless of its error. I'm persuaded that if it were not for the religious system based on human merit, we would have probably likely just destroyed ourselves by now. Because despite its extraordinary efforts, mankind has continued to digress to a level akin to a world that existed during the days of Noah. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.